Madam Clerk, can we have the roll call, please? Councilmember Agency Director Christ. Present. Mann. Marcus. Here. Vice Mayor, Vice Chairman Smith. Here. Mayor Chairman Paris. We have a quorum. Do you have a motion to excuse Mayor Paris and Councilman Mann? So moved. Second. Uh, call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? It passes unanimously. Uh, tonight we have the invocation from Pastor Ryan Parrish of New Hope Community Church. Is he here? Yeah, could everybody please stand? Thank you, Pastor. Heavenly Father, we gather here tonight because uh, important business needs to be done for the people of Lancaster. And we call on you because you're a God who rules wisely and you rule justly. And God, in your great power, you're gentle. And in your justice, you're very kind and merciful. And what we need from you tonight is for these, your servants, who lead our city to be wise and to be just. We pray that you'll pour out your spirit and give them all that they need to rule wisely and justly. I pray that they will appeal to you and depend on you for hindsight, insight, and foresight. And I pray that everything they decide will be for the good of the people of Lancaster, because we need you as a city. If we're to thrive and flourish, we need your strong hand and your merciful hand. So we ask for all of this, trusting you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Councilman Chris, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Please stand. Put your hand over your heart. Repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. We have a few presentations tonight. So uh, down here, let's see here. I think I have one that's not on the agenda. First off, let's have the most amazing team at this city. Can we have all the clerk's office come up? Come on, I see you back there. Come on, come on, come on. You know, I have about, oh, I don't know, 20 something years in public service, and more than that, I can't, can't count. But this group of people here have to be some of the friendliest and the most helpful people that I know. And, and when I wasn't part of the city, they were always helpful, and, and when I was part of the city, they were very helpful. And uh, in 1984 and 94, President Ronald Reagan and President Bill Clinton respectfully signed a proclamation officially declaring Municipal Clerks Week in May, and that's the week that we're uh, celebrating now. And um, I'm not going to read all this stuff, but okay. you guys just do an <laughs> awesome job. They're the, they're the glue that keeps everything together and keep Mark and Jason in line, and, and uh, they do just an amazing job. So, so Jerry, on behalf of Mayor Paris and the City Council, and just an amazing job you do, honest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did, uh, yes. Any other comments? Thank you, thank you, thank you. They keep, she keeps us in line, too. Okay, um, we have a public service recognition week. Who's going to? Who gets public service recognition week? They added this on there. It wasn't on the agenda. Or we just announce it. Just announce it. I don't I get to give it to anybody? No. Okay, so it says, Americans are served every single day by public servants, federal, state, county, and city officials, all of these ladies and gentlemen over here. And uh, so this is uh, the Public Service Recognition Week. So on behalf of uh, Mayor Paris and the City Council, I don't know, we'll give, we'll, we'll give it to our public works people today. So here, we'll give it to Robert. He's accepting it on behalf of all the city staff. So now so from, for some really cool stuff. 
mean, ever since I was a little kid, right, we always talked about robots, and now we got high school uh, students actually making ones that the, uh, the movies couldn't even think of. So Lancaster High School's Eagle Robotics team is part of the first or for inspiration and recognition of science and technology, which is an international organization that promotes science and education. Each year the team builds a robot that is designed to accomplish specific tasks as they face off in regional events with the competition culminating in the international championships. Triumphant performance, well it says James Bot, is that the name of your uh, robot this year? How'd you pick James? Ron was taken. Now that was Scott in the back who said I'm not supposed to say anything about him today, so he lost that one. Uh, James Bot is one of the most complex robots the team has ever designed and features motors, gears, and electronics to propel and steer and to operate the arm and claw. Triumphant performance at the 2011 Utah Regional garnered a first place win and earned the team an invitation to the International Championship in St. Louis. Now, when are you going to St. Louis? You want, how'd you do? Four divisions. Well, excellent. So, we have some certificates for you. There's a whole lot. So uh, if you come on up, uh, take your certificate and just go stand behind us, and we're going to get some pictures. Jordan Backus. Jordan? Is Jordan here? Okay. Tell me if they're not here. So, Kayla Barbosa. Melinda Barbosa. Sam Bartell. There you go. Congratulations. Good job. Reagan Basham. Teresa Bastian. I know you. Johnny Brown. Summer Che. Alessandro Galino. You didn't, you didn't have a robot to come and take him? Jeremy Jermita. Nathan Gonzalez. John Graham. Brian Has Haslett. Haslett. Bradley Hall. Michael Herrera. You guys got tired of clapping every time when nobody's here? <laughs> Doug, they're watching on TV. Doug Lawrence. Brady Maida, Sean Mahaffey, Janice Miguel. Are these people on your team? Okay. Jolie Miguel, Asia Mott. Yay, Asia! Okay. Erica Park. You don't want Jorge's? Sorry. <laughs> Erica Park. I just got so excited that somebody was here. Okay. Lauren Park. Good, Lauren. I think you can Jackie Patton. Christian Pereira. Pereira. Nicholas Pontius. Pontius. Zachary Quincy, Sandra Rangel. We only got one left, right? Let me see. It's not Austin Reynolds. Sarah Ritter. Did we get a Sarah? <laughs> Elite. Did I? Where? Okay, we'll figure it out. Olivia Robinson, Nicole Rodriguez. I know. <laughs> Kaylee Romero. Come on up. You've got to read all the names here. Oh, did you make? Okay. James Rusica. Victor Ruiz. Moises Sales. Samantha Sarahinda. Amanda Tepe. Amber Tepe.
Caitlin. And then Kathy Tran, Robert Wong. Anybody else here? We'll, we'll, we'll read all the names. Brittany, Brittany Rye, Kevin Spolestra. <laughs> Carol Lowe, Kylie Kraft, Richard Chambers, David Vrasic. Julie Vrasic, Renee Harrow, Sylvia Harrow. You wonder why the mayor didn't come tonight, right? It's just, I got Jerry Pontius, Glenn Graham, Mike Mahaffey, Mitch Haslett, Barbara Pollock. Let's give them all a big. We have a special award for the whole team. To put it Ron, do they have a coach? Oh, the principal's here. Okay. Come on down, Steve. You must be proud of these kids. Very much so. What a great job. They failed to mention. They said it a little nicer. They took ninth in the nation. Ninth in the nation. Can we have the rest of the council come down? Let's get a picture taken with them. Sherry, come on down. There you go. Let's go. We'll go to get in the middle here. What's the name of our young man that came late to the table? Oh, did we? John Graham. John Brown. It'll take him a half hour. Look at this. Yeah, any family members, mothers, dads, come on. Aunts, uncles, sisters, friends. We'll squirt over here. Put some of the. There we go. Mr. Deputy City Manager, is there any items to be removed at this time? None? There is still one presentation that needs to go first before you get to that. Uh, but the answer to your oh, question oh, is presentation. no. Oh, presentation. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. We got... Okay. So we'll ask, and that's going to be uh, Mr. Tanatongo. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor, members of the City Council. We're excited tonight to present to you uh, the launch of the 2011 Unite Lancaster program. Um, as you may know, the Safe and Stronger Neighborhood uh, Committee, which, which is made up of um, city of em employees of all, all our departments in collaboration with the Lancaster Vitalization Commission, Neighborhood Vitalization Commission, put on uh, for the first time last year the Unite Lancaster program, and we're bringing it ba back again this year. And tonight, um, I do want to ask our uh, employee Safe and Stronger Neighborhood Committee members to stand up and be recognized because they are really the, the heart and soul of putting this program together. And these are the members who, who do put this program and coordinate it together. And thank you. And then I, I'm going to ask uh, Patty Garibay, who's the chairperson of the Safe and Stronger Neighborhoods Committee, as well as Luis Garibay, to come up and make a presentation.
Thank you. Good afternoon. As Kelvin mentioned, we're very excited to kick off our second annual Unite Lancaster program. Under the leadership of Councilwoman Sherry Marcus, Safer Stronger Neighborhood members and Lancaster Neighborhood Vitalization Commissioners collaborated to create a program that we believed would empower neighborhoods and strengthen the bonds between neighbors. For many years, the city hosted the Looking Good Lancaster program, which adopted a neighborhood and brought community volunteers together for a neighborhood cleanup. While the program worked, our group believed that there was a greater potential for ownership if neighbors collaborated and took action on projects that they designed. We felt that creativity was crucial and we wanted neighbors to think outside of the box in planning activities that would promote safety and neighborhood interaction in new ways. Now let me pause while we show a quick video highlighting some of the projects that we did last year. Improve the quality of life in our city by participating in the Unite Lancaster program. Improve the appearance of your neighborhood, neighbor relations, and promote neighborhood safety. The Unite Lancaster program can provide the resources needed to bring your ideas to fruition. Unite Lancaster is a program of the city's Safer, Stronger Neighborhood Committee in cooperation with the Lancaster Vitalization Commission. Through Unite, the city provides small grants or resources to grassroots organizations that want to bring a neighborhood together through a community project. We encourage neighborhood groups to be creative and develop projects which improve the overall well-being of the community. Submitted projects will be evaluated and selected based on their self-reliance, involvement, sustainability, benefits, partnerships, and innovation. Unite Lancaster has supported meaningful community projects, including a youth entrepreneur training program, multiple community gardens, and neighborhood potlucks. Improve the quality of life in your neighborhood. Thank you. As you can see from the video, our first program year was a huge success with a total of 37 applications being received and 11 projects being facilitated last fall. Over 500 community members participated in diverse projects which included neighborhood potlucks, several community gardens, and a youth entrepreneur training program. We were also successful in working with community partners who helped bring these projects to fruition through their sponsorship. We hope to grow Unite Lancaster this year and encourage residents to get together and start thinking of ways that they can improve their neighborhoods. Our application period will start on May 16th and end on June 17th. Project categories include beautification, neighborhood interaction, and public safety. Now, beautifica beautification uh, projects include some of the more traditional programs that you're used to, things like community gardens, neighborhood cleanups. Um, they can focus around a neighborhood school, perhaps a park, or even just an empty lot that has become an eyesore. The second group is uh, neighborhood interaction, and, and this is the, the aim is really to try to get people out of their homes to get to meet their neighbors and create those relationships and bond together so that they can create the community that we're all after. Uh, it can be done through a neighborhood block party, a uh, holiday celebration, or a cultural program. Uh, it's really up to them. The last is public safety. Uh, public safety um, is really anything that can include helping the overall public safety of a community. Um, now it could be something simple like improving lighting, uh, cleaning up trash, um, or even programs that are aimed at helping children and educating them about public safety tips. Now it's important to point out that while we only have three kind of categories for the, for the, for the program, that we're not limiting it to just that. Uh, we, we're encouraging groups and organizations and neighborhoods to uh, uh, submit all types of applications. Because again, we want them to be innovative and creative. Uh, for example, as the video mentioned, uh, last year we had a youth entrepreneurship program, which wouldn't have fit in one of these categories. But uh, they had enough community support. They had a, we thought it was a great program as a committee. So that was one of the, uh, the programs that was selected uh, to participate last year. Now you're thinking, what are some of the judging criteria? As the video mentioned again, uh, we're, looking, we're really looking at empowering these groups to kind of create these projects that aren't just a one-time deal, but they're going to be uh, continue to grow, gain momentum, and again, create some of that community support that uh, they're all after. A couple of important dates for uh, everyone to, to remember. Uh, we're going to open up the application period next Monday, which is May, 6th, uh, May 16th, and it's going to be open until June 17th. Um, on uh, August 2nd, during the Neighborhood Vitalization um, Committee meeting, we'll be announcing those that are selected to participate in the program. And then the big, the big uh, program will happen on Saturday, September uh, 24th. 
Now, it, it's important to, uh, to take a minute to recognize some of the programs and uh, sponsors that help make this possible. Um, if it wasn't for their help, we wouldn't have been able to select uh, the, the number of programs that we did last year. So it's important uh, for us to, uh, to recognize them at this time. Now, we know many of you were involved in some of the projects last year, and we, we hope to have your continued support going forward this year and really helping us get the word out. Uh, to neighborhood groups, you know, you guys come across constituents on a daily basis. Get the word out, uh, let communities know it, and work with us to try to create uh, another great batch of projects uh, for this year. So with that, we'd like to thank you for our time, uh, for your time, and if there's any questions um, that we can answer right now, we'd be more than happy to do so. You have, uh... you have sponsors like uh, Home Depot, Waste Management, Roundtable, Walmart, and Target. Are there room for other corporate sponsors? Absolutely. Absolutely. And who do they contact? Patty. They could contact me um, in the Parks Department. Okay. Thank you. And again, most of those organizations will do kind of in-kind. So if community gardens, they're the ones donating the shovels and the mulch and, and the plants to plant. So it could be an in-kind uh, contribution as well. Very good. Okay. Now, are there groups that can, I think it was the FBI is what the, the kids group ended yeah. up um, with their little group name, mm -hmm. but um, how do we get more kids involved in that? Do they, are they applying? Was that one that applied specifically for that group of kids? No, it was actually a, um, it was a community organization that wanted, they had a lot of groups participate in different programs through their organization, and they thought that this would be a good program for them to learn some leadership skills and also learn a little bit more about the business world. And so they designed the project knowing that they, there were kids out in the community that could benefit from it. And so it was actually designed by the community organization, though. Okay. Well, but right. through the committee, we've obviously worked with uh, local school, you know, mm -hmm. the, the local schools at all different levels to help spread the word. Um, and we're obviously encouraging a lot of the, uh, the younger people to apply. And, and if they need help, obviously we're here to do that as well. Well, those kids had to come up with their own business plan and everything. Yeah. From what I remember, they did a great job. We had a PowerPoint, I think, right. that yeah. they did, too. And actually, they probably did... Um, some better business plans that I've seen. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we'll have more involved this year. You guys did a great job with that, too. Thank you. Great job. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay, at this time, if there's uh, thank you, everybody, for coming, and uh, we'd like to have your public comment on the items here. If you'd like to speak, there's speaker cards in the back, and we need you to submit one so we can uh, run an orderly meeting. Uh, they need to be turned in prior to the start of that agenda item. Uh, this rule applies if you wish to speak on non-agendized items also, following the process to allow and conduct a timely and orderly meeting. We're also going to request that you actually stay on point. Sometimes you want to talk about other things that aren't on the agenda item that you're actually bringing up. And during non-agendized items, we'd like you to stick to city business. Uh, rather than county or state or other things, things that we're actually making decisions on. So um, we need to pull CC5 and CC6 because we have speakers' cards on that. But uh, agency actions, consent ca calendar. Do I hear any motions? I'll move that we um, approve the consent calendar as comprised. Do I hear a second? Second. Call for a vote. And passes unanimously. Um, Motion to approve the minutes. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Call for a vote. Do I hear a motion for the consent calendar is currently comprised? So moved. Second. Call for a vote. Passes. Uh, Emily Holmes. Or a meal, Holmes. Which one okay, is this? You one? have you have CC five dash CC six. Yeah. So, you know, so the first one CC five, which is a subdivision map. Yes, sir. So, what do you have to say about uh, KB Home Harvard Homes LCC and that particular track map number six two zero seven five? Actually, I was trying to see what I could fit. You know everything in, and that's why I put it the, at the last one um, as a group. Um, do you have Do you have a comment on us accepting or not accepting CC five? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, I'll, so I'll we're going to scratch it from CC five. Yeah, CC six is 
a uh, sub-recipient agreement between the City of Lancaster and the Housing Rights Center. No. Okay, so we have, a, we have an agreement between those for a block grant in 2011. No, oh, all, that's, all that's fine. All that's fine, sir. So um, you have something to speak on other than those yes, two sir. items? I, yeah. Okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put, so you have an opportunity yeah, to speak. I'm going to put non-agendized. Yes, sir. And we're going to put you in a non-agendized pile because since you're not speaking on those two items. Yes, sir. So go ahead and have a seat, and we'll call you back at the end oh, of the meeting. That, that's fine. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. So on CC6, um, we have uh, Nicole Parsons. I don't see Nicole here. She's so, in, oh, there you go. Nicole. Do you have something on the uh, specifically, Nicole, on the Housing Services Community Development Block Grant? Uh, which one is that? CC6? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, hi. I thought under. Um, I thought, well, I was actually um, supposed to start. Um, it was President Bush's. Um, call for access of ju access to justice, but um, I believe it's coming this year, and um, this is. Does that have to do on the block grant? I think so because it's the housing fair housing the What's fair that? housing law services. Is that the one? The block grant. Does that have to do with the fair housing law services? The law services yes. given because I need is that, to Is that correct? Is that a connection with that? With the no. This is a requirement by HUD that you have provide fair housing services. Yeah, so it's a... That, that would be different than the reallocation of the, um, the legal services, right? Because, I mean, if you could give me a report, the legal services were for right, which so type, what group of people? It's not on, it's not on this topic, so go ahead and... This topic have some right more. here on CC6, right? On the block grant. Can I get a, re a report? Okay, it's just a reallocation of the of the, the current service of um, legal services this or is because it's the Federal Housing Authority um, um, required. Nicole, this is the time for you to make comments and not really, you know, uh, ask questions. Okay, well, so okay. thank you, sir. If you have comments directly on the grant, then yes, we'll take um, that at this time yes, before we Yes, I vote. think, well, because this was one of the services that were in, ineffective, that, um, and so if I could, I could, sort of mitigate the difference or how um, that, that it's improving, but um, like I said, I, I was supposed to start um, the access to justices here, and um, I can submit it to, through Kevin and his, and, and his um, your guys' Unite program, but this one, is it, is it some type of expansion? Because the, the legal service was probably not that effective, and if it's for the... Um, Federal requirement. I, I don't think that it's justified, but maybe we can modify it. I wouldn't requ uh, say totally. Uh, maybe take account of the, the people that are actually using it, and then that would be helpful too to start the. Um... Okay. Thanks, Nicole. Okay. At this time, do I hear a motion for CC5 and CC6? Motion to approve CC5, CC6. Do I hear a second? Second. Call for a vote. Passes unanimously. Uh, joint public hearing one. I'll open up the public hearing, and we actually have a, a card here. So, could we have the uh, staff report, please? Mr. Mayor, if there's only one card there, who? There's another card that was just submitted, indicating that a previous card for JP one. Or JPH one. Oh, oh that one is not. Okay. Oh, I thought. That, oh, okay. I thought it was the same card, and you were just. So, the, I understand what you're saying now. Okay. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Without objection, we'll uh, we'll waive the reading of the staff report. That's fine. I'll close the public hearing, and we'll entertain any motions at this time. Uh, agency recommendation first. Uh, make a motion that we adopt resolution number zero nine eleven for the agency. Okay. Uh, call for vote. And for the city to adopt the resolution number 11 22. Second. Call for a vote. 
Vote passes unanimously. Uh, PH1, we'll open up the public hearing at this time. We have a, a card. This is on the project of 2001. One year action plan applications. <coughs> Nicole, you have a card in that says recycled development. Does that have to do anything with this agenda I item? The name of my firm, I design. Who's, who's doing the staff report on that one? Liz, does that have anything to do with her proposed? Okay, we're, we're going to skip you then, Nicole. Uh, without objection, we're going to waive the reading of the staff report and uh, close the public hearing, uh, and we'll entertain any motions on PH1 at this time. Make a motion we approve PH1. Second. Call for a vote. Passes unanimously. PH2, we'll open up the public hearing. We have a speaker's card, so could we have the staff report, please? Thank you. This agenda item would be the adoption of an ordinance that would amend an ordinance that was adopted by the City Council about 18 months ago. That ordinance regulated the placement of cargo containers within various zones of the city. This ordinance would provide an, ex an exception into that ordinance that would allow the placement of those containers when they are used for the exclusive storage of emergency supplies that would be available to the public in the event, in the event of an emergency situation. The Planning Commission looked at this at their meeting on April the 18th. They unanimously have recommended to you adoption of this ordinance amendment. I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have on it. Any questions for staff at this time? Thank you, Mr. Lukey. Susan, I can't read the last name. It's it's handwriting. Champus? Champion. Champion. I'm sorry. Um, real quick, I just wanted to say it's a really important measure and uh, an adoption. So if you guys can approve it, that would be great. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, without any, uh, any other comments, we'll close the public hearing and we'll open it up for a council discussion or motions. Make a motion we introduce ordinance number 964 to approve. Call for a vote. <clears throat> Passes unanimously. PH3, introduction of horse-drawn vehicles. Uh, we'll open up the uh, public hearing at this time, and uh, we have a, uh, a speaker, so we'll ask for this, a quick staff report. Mr. Tanatongo gets to do this one. This is twice today. Usually we don't get to hear you at all. So. Oh, this is going to be my quota for the year. <laughs> Still can't beat Liz, though. <clears throat> Thank you, Vice Mayor Smith, members of the City Council. A couple of months ago, we had the owners of the Sweetwater Ranch, um, who actually are here tonight also, uh, right behind me, come to the City Council and requested to have horse-drawn carriage business um, featured on the boulevard in the City Council, thought that that was a grand idea, and instructed staff to go back and develop and draft a ordinance for consideration. And so tonight, uh, we're pleased to present to you uh, an ordinance to introduce uh, that uh, allows horse-drawn carriages in the city. Um, but this, this came with a lot of research and a collaboration with the City Attorney's Office and the uh, Finance Department on uh, to make sure we have a, an airtight ordinance. Um, uh, we had uh, input from Animal Care and Control, our local shelter here, as well as headquarters, um, the, uh, the Sweetwater Ranch folks, other equine um, uh, activists, and so we think we've put together a, a pretty good um, ordinance here. And I have tonight uh, Monique Edwards with the Finance Department. We'll go briefly over some of the, uh, the highlights of the ordinance. Good evening, Vice Mayor, fellow council members. Um, as, Kevin, as Kelvin has already mentioned, we did receive input from all parties involved, um, considering processes and procedure enforcement, things of that nature on the city side, considering input from the business owners, considering input from animal care and control for the protection of the animals. So there are a few um, 
items that I would just like to highlight that we've included in the ordinance. There are many others, but these were some of the key components that we felt that were important to bring to your attention tonight. In regards to the permitting requirements, there are two separate types of permits. A permit will be required for the owner of the horse-drawn vehicle, and a permit will be required for each driver of the horse-drawn vehicle. So there would be two separate permits required. For the owner's permits, in addition to basic information such as their name, their age, their driver's license number, we would require a summary of their past experience to be included with, the part of, with their application, um, a statement as to whether or not they've ever been convicted of any violations of Section 597 of the, of the Penal Code, or any crimes involving the abuse or cruelty to any types of animals. The number of horse-drawn vehicles that they intend to operate or control within the city when conducting their business. Um, we have also will require that they provide evidence acceptable to the city manager that proves that they are indeed the owners of the horse-drawn of the vehicle itself as well as the animal. We would require a statement that each horse-drawn vehicle be utilized by the applicant also have an emergency braking system in the event of an emergency. In regards to the driver's permit on their application, we would also require that they notify us if they've been in violation of any sections of the Penal Code, um, Section 597, or any crimes inv involving the abuse or neglect to animals. We would also require a copy of their um, driver's license issued by the Department of Motor Vehicles, as well as a printout of their driving record showing that their privileges for driving have not been suspended or revoked within the last 12 months, <coughs> and evidence that they have completed a horse-drawn vehicle driver proficiency and or training program. And on this particular bullet, which is under Section 5.54050A6, there are two typos that we would ask to be able to be corrected if this um, ordinance is approved tonight. The spelling of driver would be corrected and the spelling of manager. We apologize for that mistake. Under um, operating regulations, there are several regulations that we put into place to ensure the protection of all parties involved, including our citizens. No single animal should be, re should be allowed to pull a vehicle that holds more than five people plus the driver. And we felt it was important to limit that number to protect, one, the weight of the animals, of the the weight that the animal is pulling, the passengers contained in the vehicle itself, and citizens, if anything were to take place with the animal on the public street, there are other people that could be involved. So we felt it was very important to limit the capacity in the carriage. We also received lots of feedback from animal care and control in regards to this particular item. Uh, we would require that any animals that they could not have any types of open wounds or sores, that they could not have any disease or ailments, and if they do, then they would have to have written approval by a veterinarian that allows that animal to work. Um, animals should not be subjected to any types of condition or treatment, whether they're in service, working, or out of service that would impair their good health or their physical condition. With that, um, no animal should be able to pull vehicles in temperatures higher than 90 degrees Fahrenheit or in any temperatures lower than 35 degrees Fahrenheit. And we felt it was important to impose those temperature restrictions not only for the air temperature, but the temperature of the asphalt that the animals will be pulling the vehicles on. Air temperature can be a certain degree. The temperature of the asphalt can be up to 40 to 50 degrees higher than that of the air. So with the input of animal care and control, we did feel it was important to restrict the temperature capacity up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, again, the vi any vehicle operated on a public street shall be maintained in a safe mechanical condition and shall be equipped with an emergency braking system.
Each horse-drawn vehicle should be equipped with electrically powered lights or lanterns and reflectors. And they should always use those lights during operating hours of the, during darkness and when it's raining. Each horse-drawn vehicle that's operated on the public street should also be equipped with properly installed and maintained devices to catch feces before it falls to the ground and to ensure that any feces or waste that's deposited on any public street must be cleaned up immediately. For any urine that's on the ground, it must immediately be diluted with water or water with a disinfectant. The vehicles must be equipped with a sweat resistant fly spray. Um, this was stressed, the importance of this item was stressed by animal care and control because of the number of flies that the animals attract and the response that the animal can have to the flies being on it. So we felt it was important that the vehicles always have to have spray on them. Um, any vehicles that are operated on a public street cannot impede the flow of normal traffic. So whenever there's two or more vehicles that are unable to pass or continue on a public street, then the, the, the horse-drawn vehicle must um, move over and uh, pull over immediately and allow the normal flow of traffic to proceed. The drivers of the horse-drawn vehicles must always carry in their possession with them a copy or the original bus business license or permit issued by the city and also the animal's health certificate. If there were ever any um, issues where enforcement either through city personnel, the sheriff, animal care and control had to address a vehicle on the street it's important for us to know that the animal that is being used is the appropriate animal and that the vehicle is permitted to operate within the city. None of the permits are transferable, not for the owner's permit or the driver's permit. And the hours of operation have been prohibited between 12 midnight and 8.30 a.m. on any given day. Um, those were a few of the... What was the times again for us? Between the hours of 12 midnight and 8.30 a.m. on any day. Cannot operate. So that was just a few of the many items that have been included in this draft, considering all parties and all entities. And with that, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them for you. Where are the horses going to be? You said if they impede the traffic, they're going to, they need to pull over. Where are they going to pull over? They need to pull over to the safest curbed area or if, say for example, if they were in the downtown on the boulevard, there's not as much space. It would depend if there's vehicles parked there or not. In that case, they would need to pull over off into the next side street. Okay. Qu question on that. Uh, just in the back of my mind someplace, there seems to be some regulation in the vehicle code on the right-of-way of horses. So how does that relate to there, and is there any preemption on that? But I can't remember exactly specifically what the – I thought uh, that there's something something in the vehicle code uh, pertaining to horses in the right-of-way. We'll take a look at that. I, okay. I don't remember that, but uh... – because we we'll look at it, and obviously they have to re, they have to comply with the vehicle code, right? But I mean, the, if the vehicle code is in conflict with what we're saying, then is there a preemption there? So I don't know. Vehicle con, would code would control. Right. So we'll have to look at that that issue there. The other question I have is that on the licensing, when you talk about uh, it's a particular horse and, and they can only carry so many um, passengers. Yes. Right. Is there any flexibility with that for the future? Because I know like when you go to Disneyland, they have one of those huge draft horses that pulls that big trolley with about 10 people in it, right? It's no problem for him. So, I mean, if somebody comes up and says, hey, we're having a hayride that day, and we have, you know, a couple of draft horses that are pulling 20 people, can they 
So, I mean, is there any flexibility in the future for that? Absolutely. And in this draft that you have before you, there is a section that allows the city manager to promulgate any additional requirements or regulations as he, think, as he sees fit. So, absolutely, there is room for flexibility. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions from anybody else? Okay, thank you. Uh, speaker Monica Whitmer. Good evening, Council. Um, my husband and I are really excited that we've made it this far. We've really enjoyed working with Kelvin. He's kept us pretty informed through the process. Um, the issue that you just brought up is one that concerns us. It came up at the last minute, um, and that was the five-person limitation, which was uh, the way it is written, it includes the driver. Um, I always work with my husband, Jack. He's always riding beside me, in essence, shotgun, no gun involved. But he's for With a bucket of water, right? Yeah, he, exactly. That's part of it. <laughs> he's, he's there. If there's, he helps people in and out of the carriage. So that limits us to three people in the carriage. Um, that becomes very small number, and if two couples want to go for a ride, you've just told us we can't do it. Um, it is within the Kona, the carriage operators of North America, they say that a horse can pull two and a half times his weight without any strain, and this is a national organization that answers this question. And as you say, the Disneyland trolley horses pull 20 people, so it, the restriction is a little too restrictive in my opinion. Um, if it could be worded in such a way to say a horse shall not pull more than twice his weight and even state that uh, generally accepted this would be six passengers or something like that. But to simply arbitrarily say five total people on board the carriage is too restrictive for what we want to do. So qu qu for a question on that, and we'll let you speak some more, but and that's the, that's the thing that was popping in my mind too. When you say five people, I mean there's some big five people. That's you know you could you could have some five people, four people in there that are like you know they, that horse shouldn't be pulling them, and then you can have you know maybe seven people that you know you could go for a nice carriage ride. So I, so saying how many that doesn't you know that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't really say that poor horse could be dragging some people around all day. So uh, not to point any fingers. So but. So, so how do we solve that? Well, I think I think if we go with the national, can we go with the national standard and change it that and make it even more onerous and say twice the weight, approximately six people or five well, people or something like that? First of all, Ms. Ms. Whitmer is absolutely correct. In fact, that's the comment we got back from uh, Animal Care and Control. The problem is though is enforcing that. You know, we're not able to determine from the staff point of view what's two and a half times the weight of you know that the horse can pull so that's why we we started looking at the number of of uh, passengers that the carriage can um, can hold now it, the, maybe the best solution is to um, have that number excluding the the two drive you know up to two drivers if, the, if that's okay five uh, excluding two drivers because what if you had a couple little kids I was gonna say with families we can yeah, put I mean, six on board very easily when two parents two and three little kids yeah yeah who made the recommendation of five? Th that was between staff and the city attorney coming up with, after talking with animal care and control, and actually talking with animal care and control in the room as to, because uh, they did, they agreed that it was two and a half times the, the weight of the horse, but unable to enforce that out in the field, we needed to come up with a number, and we looked at the, 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 the type of these carriages, and we're certainly flexible. I mean, I think that number is going to be var varying, but the key is to make sure that the horse isn't pulling uh, more weight than it, than it can handle. Can we introduce this ordinance now as it is and make amendments to it uh, uh, at next council meeting? If, if you make amendments at the next council meeting, well, then you have to reintroduce. reintroduce. So it would be better to come up with something tonight, see how it works, and then uh, we could always uh, <coughs> review it in the, in the future. But, you know, maybe a, a solution would be exclude the drivers and maybe any... Uh, Children under the age, a certain age. Under 12. Under 12. Okay. And, and then put in there the weight. So just in case, I mean, you see, they could have 50 kids under 12 in there then, you know. So, I mean, but yeah. maybe, maybe put the weight in there not to exceed. So maybe if we write it, you know. Um, Ron, I wouldn't have a problem if you put both of those in it if right. we exclude the uh, driver and passenger but the total weight not to exceed right not to exceed two and a half times uh, so if you put both of them in there 
at least right. we can come back and look at it. Okay. So, um, so why don't, why don't we, put, Dave? You got some language right off the top. I'm just thinking of some here. So, um, the not to exceed, not to. Uh, yeah, let me, let me actually let me look at the paragraph where that is and and just develop some quick language for you and and I think you can continue with testimony while I do that. Okay, uh, this is the last testimony. Why don't we keep the public hearing open for right now and then we'll just. Um, well, let's let's close the. Let's, if you're finished, let's close. I it. well, there's one other okay, item that again in, in talking with Kelvin, we had talked about heat, and obviously we do not wish to work our horse in excessive heat. Um, however, I'm a long-term resident of the Antelope Valley, and 90 degrees is still extremely restrictive. Um, I had presented information that generally with working horses, you do what's called a heat index, which is a combination of the uh, relative humidity plus the ambient temperature. And anything below 130, a horse is considered capable of full work, full performance, whether a racehorse or a draft horse working or a carriage horse. Um, 90 degrees, especially given the um, Lancaster's typical humidity, is really low and um, again becomes rather restrictive in a summer's evening when the temperature starts to come down. It might not get down to 90 until 9 or 10 o'clock at night. So that's the, the primary time that we want to work, we will be restricted from working. I had suggested that we use a very conservative uh, suggestion of not to ever work a horse over 100 degrees, no matter what the relative humidity, and not to work a horse um, in conditions over a heat index of 130. And I feel that this allows us to operate without risking the horse. Uh, my research showed that temperatures over 100, even with low humidity, a horse has a mild increase in risk of heat stroke. So I wouldn't want to work him then either. But again, 90 degrees here in Lancaster is is... Right. Fairly limiting in beyond evening, reason. 90, 90 degrees can, in the evening can feel pretty good. Yeah, yeah. So what the only, when we're getting into this now, that seems to take a little bit more. We're not in as big of a hurry to get the ordinance out as you are. And I think to, to work it out, I mean, unless we're going to go with what we have here, the temperature and those things I think is not something that we can just knock out language on right now. So we'd have to continue it for the next council meeting, which would be two weeks or three weeks, I forgot what the date is, so that we could actually, staff could look at that a little bit more. Well, that's, that's why That's important I to you. If the 90 degrees, and it might be, that might be a sticking point where they might not even be able to get out there during the summer days when we're having the festivals and stuff. But I don't know how the rest of the council... Who made that. the recommendation? The recommendation also was from Animal Care and Control. I, I had to have conversations with veterinarians in the valley here because I, I wanted to get their perspective because oftentimes if you're down in headquarters of animal care and control, which is where the comment came from, they're not familiar with uh, um, our temperatures up here. And granted, it is hot, but we've got workhorses up here all the time. Um, and so I decided to talk to a few veterinarians. Now, the, the difficulty what they presented to me was that um, really what they're saying is that the, if the horse gets adequate rest, um, you know, most horse owners aren't going to put their horses out there at 100 degrees temperature, but the key is that they get adequate rest and water. Right. Um, so I tried to ask them, well, what would be a good index then or temperature gauge? And um, they varied. They came in from anywhere from 90 to 100 degrees, but all of them said that the key was that they get adequate rest and shade and water um, and not worked too hard because up here they have, you know, they're, they're acclimated to the weather up here. And that seems to be the, the onus of the owner. They don't want to hurt their animal. They're in business, and they've been with horses for a long time. I know my son actually used to go to a ranch every summer for a couple of weeks, and it was like 110 out there past Barstow, and they were on the horses all day long. So, But I, but my, my gut feeling is we should maybe put it over till the next meeting and just work that out because that might be – that threshold, like you said, in the evening, in the summer, when you're going to be getting the most business, might be the time that you can't be doing it. So I don't. I would. You you talked with animal care. You talked with the vets, and they all recommended somewhere between 90 and 100. That is correct. I, I will say that uh, Ms. Whitmer has her own veterinary veterinarian who has um, mentioned. And I, I did not talk to uh, Dr. Martin E directly, but I know she has talked with him and talked about the 130 degree heat index, 
but I hadn't been able to verify that. That was one of the veterinarians I wasn't able to talk with. Well, I did, if I can interject, I did give you the scientific uh, study that, that linked to that and showed that, you know, 180 is absolutely a horse shouldn't come out of his stall. 150 you need to curtail, and 130 is considered a very safe threshold. Right. And, and if, if this was an ordinance that we came up with to come up with, I would say, well, okay, then we, but this is, right now, this is our only, <laughs> this is the only horse-drawn carriage that, that we have. This ordinance was sort of almost created so you, you guys could provide this wonderful service for the, for the boulevard. So, I mean, I, I'm still feeling like maybe we should just put it off just for two weeks and look at it some more, but what, how do you feel about that? I would have a problem with uh, changing the heat index over 90. If we have vets here that are saying that's what's safe for the horse, I would have a problem. So it's up to you. <clears throat> I think it, it then comes down to which authority are you going to listen to. I'm not sure which vets he's spoken to. Mm -hmm. well, did he say 90 that, to 100? that Kona regulations? Kona regulations, um, I didn't check on their heat index because that didn't come up until tonight. I hadn't even known that that was going to be in there. Um, I, I mostly was concerned with the five total people. Um, so I'd have to check my Kona regs to see if they have a, a, a heat index re reference in there or not. Um, one of the other things that, again, I fully appreciate the desire to ensure that not only myself, but anybody else who pre becomes a vendor in this, treats their horses properly and I mean I can stand up here and convince you all that I would never mistreat my horse right. since this is one I bottle fed but Joe Schmoozy who maybe is a little less attached right. might be a problem so I understand the need to create a set of regulations that protects right. the safety of the horse and also makes sure that animal rights activists are comfortable with these horses working one of the ways that it would be handled is to simply put a requirement that every two hours the horse must be unhitched that's about where I would be anyway, that the horse has to have 30 minutes or right. out of carriage rest every two hours. I'm very comfortable with that. And that, I think, again, that that's where the, the vets who are thinking, well, if this horse is going to be forced to pull a carriage for eight hours straight, then 90 degrees, not 100. Right. And they said, and they said the variability is from 90 to 100. So why do we pick? We pick 90 to be safe. Why don't we pick 95, 98, or 93? And then also they say they get enough water, they get enough rest. So I don't know. There just seems a lot of variability. Well, my only concern is that there be another organization that comes in town, wants to do the same right. thing right. you're doing, and they bring their horses from you know, who knows where that aren't acclimated to the Antelope Valley. So I would say maybe it does need to be worked on in specific. I hate to make you wait for two more weeks, but my concern was, is that going to be your uniform of the day for this? Well, I do have a vest underneath, so in summer, yes, we will, we will go down to just the beautiful burgundy vest that we have, because okay. yes, it, if I can't work, my horses can't work, so yeah, we, we do have a slightly lighter, but we will be formal all the time. We feel it's very important, but we will go down to this. And so she brought up another issue, too, so if it's 90 degrees, but they're working at eight hours, then... Is there something written in the ordinance that the horse needs to have? So, I don't know, it just seems a little bit, somebody could work their horse all day long and get just as much heat exhaustion at 90 right. degrees mm -hmm. without enough water and without enough rest. So, yeah. I mean, these are very important aspects, and I would rather not get started until July and do it right than rush and then have to try to amend. I mean, it was like the immediacy of cleaning up the um, any feces that misses or if the horse urinates in the street. Right. Um, the immediacy word is very difficult because um, if you don't require somebody riding shotgun, is the driver supposed to dismount from the carriage, abandon the horse, and then pour the water in the street? That word immediacy is, is very risky because you basically put the person in, in, they have to violate the law one way or another. They either have to abandon their carriage or they have to leave whatever it is in the street. Um, in Riverside, it says at the end of the shift. Oh, at the end of the shift. So, so there's a number of questions. There's the right-of-way issue. There's the getting off the carriage if there's only one rider. And what do you do with the So there's a number of issues. So I, I feel we should probably just table this to, uh, to another time if there's no objection. Uh, Dave, what would you be your, uh, what would be your preference? Do you want to keep the public hearing open, or do you want to close the public hearing over, or just table the whole thing at this point and open it up as a new public hearing? since we'll be looking at a new ordinance. It's up to you. 
Uh, let's continue the public hearing. Okay, we'll continue the public hearing to uh, next council meeting. Or should we continue it until the staff is ready, just in case it's not ready, staff report? Can you you need to continue it to a time certain, so okay. continue it to okay, we'll the continue next council it to, meeting. If we need to continue it again, we will. Right. Uh, we'll continue this to, uh, uh, without objection, to Tuesday, May 24th, 5 p.m. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's better to get it, like you said, better to get it hashed right. down and get it something that we're not going to have to come back and tweak since it's so new. We haven't had horses like this before. So. Are okay. we going to continue... 11:23. Also, uh, yeah, that's it's PH three. We're doing a public hearing three. The whole so both of them. So the ordinance 965 and the resolution 11:23 is continued until May 24th. Okay. Next we have uh, new business one. The winning pitch. Vice Mayor and Council, we're here tonight to ask for your approval of a new program called the Winning Pitch, which is designed to find funding for entrepreneurs by matching them with investors. We have a very brief um, PowerPoint and then uh, a little video in there, and then we have a presentation by Scott Ehrlich, who was the author of this idea. We're continuing to keep Lancaster's reputation as a very business-friendly city, and you can see all the different programs that we've had, and this is, this is kind of an extension of that philosophy. This all started back in 2009 when we um, uh, entered into a partnership with uh, Small Business Development Center out of the College of Canyons, and then also Wells Fargo Bank. We have Ms. Kathy Voss here with us tonight, who's our sponsor on this. The good news for the taxpayers is this is all being picked up through sponsorship. So uh, in these tough budget times, we do everything we can to stretch a buck. This is one of many programs that we have that we do for uh, expansion of entrepreneurship. Uh, obviously, in uh, a time with the recession that we're experiencing here, uh, we need to do all we can to help small businesses succeed. Uh, I think the council is familiar with both of, most of this. Uh, the incubator program, we just recently had the boot camp. The vice mayor made a great presentation at that and uh, this will extend that effort. The program, in a nutshell, is kind of Lancaster's version of the Shark Tank. If you're not familiar with the Shark Tank, it's a television program, a reality show, that uh, allows entrepreneurs to make a pitch, if you will, to um, investors. Uh, in this particular instance, these are billionaires and uh, an entertaining show, but, but really speaks to the issue that we have, certainly nationwide, but especially in the city of Lancaster. The role of the city of Lancaster is to act as a matchmaker. We used the term in the agenda um, that we were a dating service, and that's an important concept to remember because we're not endorsing entrepreneurs, not that we wouldn't like to endorse them all, and we're not endorsing investors. We're really just a dating service that are bringing the two parties together. They will negotiate out, and then they will make the decision to proceed. But I think it's an excellent role for the city to play. As you will see, we have uh, quite a bit of marketing capability here. We're actually going to send um, email alerts to all of the business colleges in Southern California. Uh, we've got the uh, junior chamber folks that are going to participate, all those small business development centers uh, emails. So this won't be just marketed within the Antelope Valley. This will be marketed within Southern California. And our goal is to find people that want to you know, start businesses in the city of Lancaster. We also want to make the point that this isn't just for startup companies. If you watch much of this Shark Tank, and of course I've been doing a lot of that, you'll find that Many times the most successful entrepreneurs are those that are already in business and succeeding, and now they want to take the next level. They're kind of what we would call baby businesses, and, and all, all the companies are, are welcome to apply from that. I think uh, in, in talking with Scott about uh, creating the criteria here, we wanted to make sure that we didn't exclude anybody. Uh, obviously, one of the focuses is filling up the boulevard. I think Scott will talk a little bit about that, and as will the video. But, um, you know, we're also quite interested in industrial firms or anybody that's going to create jobs in our city. The program has actually been started, I'm proud to say, by an entrepreneur, Mr. Scott Ehrlich. Uh, he's already assisted over 25 businesses and raised over $7 million. Uh, they have a great number of diverse backgrounds and expertise. And we actually have a video here that I'm very proud of because we didn't do it, but the communications people did. And I think it really captures a lot better than I can um, you know why we're so excited about this so we'll do that it's a very short video I promise
find something that you are super passionate about and you would do without any pay at all, then you know that's what you need to get into. This is Scott's and this is Scott's project and the city of Lancaster that they want to create jobs and the small business to succeed. And so for him to, you know, be willing to back me and put me in a shop um, it has been my ultimate dream that I never thought would happen. I started out in my home uh, decorating for weddings. Um, found out that the talent that I have, the different things that I collected over the years, going to places and finding this is a really good deal. I want to buy this and put this in my inventory. Got to where I had a very large inventory. Motorcycle shows were very, very hot. That was the place to be. So we would, like Jethro, with all our friends and all their trucks with all our junk hanging off the back, and we'd go set up. Well, from doing that, we got so many customers to build custom bikes because Mike would bring his sheet metal work down there and they'd see it. Howard Ehrlich, like I say, is Scott Ehrlich's dad. Um, I worked for him from seven, 1977 to 92, and that's where I learned this. And he's a great person, too, you know. I mean, I guess the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Timing is everything, and if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. So I came across um, Scott and his very... Mary Band of <laughs> Scott and this band of merry men. So we ran into a friend at a car show, at a, a bike show, and he said, "Oh, I have a, I know exactly where you can go." He brought us over to the city. Two years ago, Scott Ehrlich, he had in mind, and I guess already planned all the new project, all the businesses on the boulevard and whatever. And I knew Scott for many, many years ago, and he found me. And he told me that he wanted to open a deli for me. He put the shop together for me, and he's been my partner, and he's absolutely phenomenal. I'm talking, this man's brain must have tons of scrolls running around in it because there is so much going on. And he has just phenomenal, he has put together shops that have just been above and beyond what I ever thought imaginable. Mike doing work at Bex, Mike building the bowling pin, Mike doing all this, you know, anything Scott wanted Mike to make, he could make, and he was like, wow, you guys need to be down here. Now we're looking at expanding, we're looking at um, the rest of the boulevard coming together, which we are thrilled about. Oh my gosh, every time we turn around, another store's opening, and now we're looking forward to the theater opening and the museum, and who knows what the next project's going to be down the road. It's going to be really, really fantastic. I think we are succeeding. Because, you know, I mean, they don't have, and people before, they didn't have Delhi, they didn't have uh, Bex, no nightclub. It just started to come together looking so beautiful, and the palm trees, and the, you know, the foliage and everything that's coming together. It's just beautiful. It's wonderful. I love it. With that, let me introduce Scott Ehrlich. My, my number one pitch man, straight from the pearly gates. So I wasn't going to say anything until you started heckling yeah. me in the audience, you know. There's a drinking game that, you know, every time Scott's mentioned, we'd all feel good. <laughs> Not my idea. Um, but my idea was simple. Um, we were trying to fill the boulevard, and, and specifically the dog grooming place. And we had a great idea on the dog grooming place. Could not find somebody that we wanted to operate the dog grooming place. And we tried Craigslist and we tried other places. And I know the person's out there somewhere in Antelope Valley. I know they're here. I can't find them. There's no mechanism to find what we call the it factor, to find the person who wants to start their own business. Um, and, and I was watching the Shark Tank. So I came up with the idea that um, the, I always say the meaning of life is easy, living it is hard. And the same thing about running a business. The ideas are there. Actually implementing it is a very, very difficult thing to do. And what we bring to the table um, is the ability to fund it, but more important is to help a, a, a small business owner grow into something large, um, whether it's advertising or Internet or, or 
their accounting or payrolls. We know how to do that. Um, and that's what we wanted to bring to the table. I was reading earlier in Time Magazine that entrepreneurs and small businesses um, have, in all this job growth that has happened over the last three, four months, 79% of it has come from small businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, I wholeheartedly believe the next Google could be out there. The next idea, and, and the boulevard is a very minor part of it. Um, I think that we could find the right person, and I want this to be big. It could be a widget. It could be a gidget. It could be whatever. Whoever has the right idea, we will help implement it. We have a lot of investors who are willing to invest in it um, and create jobs in Lancaster. I think that's the bottom line, what it's all about. So I'm really, really excited about this project. I hope that we get a whole bunch of people out there. Uh, and I think the video made it real. I think a lot of people will, will read this and say, you know what, this is not real, or, or, or it is real. And there's a lot of people right now who are unemployed. There are a lot of people who are underemployed. And a lot of people who just can't stand going to work every single day. This is their opportunity to, um, to do something. So I'm real excited about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions for Mr. Lawson? We um, wanted to commend the sponsors. I think we mentioned, uh, obviously, the city and the JCs, Inside Development, Scott's Group, and the California Small Business Development Center, as well as Wells Fargo. And uh, I can't go on enough about the fact that uh, in this climate, it's great to have people step up. Um, the deadline to submit proposals is Tuesday, May 31st, and then the finalists will present on Tuesday, June 14th. If you've worked at all with Scotts, you know that this needed to be done at the speed of light, and I'd like to commend my staff, Luis Garibay and Shannon Dow and Trevin, uh, for getting this done, because it, it really was done very quickly. It's all online. You submit the business plans online and, and the program. And um, we think this is the first step, but it won't be the last. We really could see this growing. You know, initially we're going to bring in a bunch of, of uh, angels, is the term that's used, pretty uh, well-heeled individuals. But ultimately I'm thinking, you know, the local folks. I'd just soon invest a little money of mine in uh, downtown Lancaster as opposed to sticking into a stock market that I don't really understand. So happy to answer any questions. How is uh, Wells Fargo involved? Uh, they put up all the money. To, to do marketing, the whole the whole program is a grant, and in conjunction with the Small Business Development Center, and they've been doing that for several years. And it's it's really you know great to have a large large bank that's you know working on a local basis to fund these kinds of things. Thank you for being involved. Any other questions, comments? I just want to figure out how to um, bottle Scott Ehrlich and sell him. <laughs> <Did you? laughs> Thanks, Scott. It's a great idea. You know, if, we, if they have their own reality show, why don't we get Channel 3 to do a local reality show there we go. on it? I mean, I think that's perfect, you know, so. Are you listening back there, Wendy? <laughs> Get here yelling in the back. Um, okay, so uh, any, uh, any other comments, comments, motions? I make a motion we approve the new program winning pitch uh, for the city of Lancaster. Second. Call for a vote. Very good. Unanimous. Lancaster Finance Authority, there is no action to be taken at this time. City Manager, Director's Announcements. No announcements. No announcements. City Clerk. The wonderful City Clerk. Talented. Talented. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the time for you to submit speaker cards on any item that is not on the agenda. You'll find speaker cards at the back of the council chambers. We respectfully request that you fill the cards out completely and print as clearly as possible in case the city manager, city council, or staff needs to get in touch with you. As much as we appreciate your request to make comments before your three minutes begin, please understand your time begins when you start to speak. Individual speakers are limited to three minutes each. When you approach the podium, you'll see three lights. The green light comes on when your time begins. The yellow light comes on when you have 30 seconds remaining. And the red light comes on when your time is up. We ask that you be considerate of the allotted time to allow other speakers to have their three minutes as well. Following this procedure will allow for a smooth and timely process for the meeting. 
State law does prohibit the City Council from taking action on items not on the agenda, and your matter will be referred to the City Manager. Thank you. Well, one question before we start that. On both the agendas that I have, because I just noticed that I skipped it, we don't have C uh, Council Agenda 1 on here. Is that, is that posted and everything properly so we can handle that? Yes, time? sir, it's posted. It was an addendum, not necessarily uh, agenda, C1. Okay, so yes. we, can, we can do it right after, uh, uh, if it's okay with everyone, we'll do it right after the public comments. Okay, uh, Marsha Gutierrez. The first issue is having a shindig. Okay, City Council to please consider the following. An old-fashioned shindig at the fair with haystacks and hay rides. Country slash bluegrass music with local bands using banjos, jugs, harmonica, bass guitar, the ukulele slide guitar. Possibly add attention to the flea market and farmer market. <clears throat> Alcohol sales up to City Council. Uh, please back, bring back the country to the Animal Valley. Second issue, the Veterans Center, I'm speaking on behalf of my friends, I'm not a veteran, um, that the homeless veterans need a center during the day. Mon monetary values of the new Veterans C Center is outstanding, the homeless, too much for them. Uh, all veterans deserve recognition on bin Laden's, as I said, his death, okay? Uh, a foreclosed building, um, let's see, sorry about this. Uh, Seven-day Adventist Church on Jackman next to the Heroes Park would be appropriate, possibly. Um, a safe place for the veterans during the day. Uh, don't you think these veterans have had it hard long enough? Um, I, I, will look for, um, oh, I will look up info for homeless campground for Myrtle Beach in South Carolina. I used to live over there. And if you allow it, I'll bring you information how people can uh, rent off of a campground, because uh, you know what I'm saying? And then at the same time, <clears throat> Excuse me. You guys could, um, they could have a place where almost the same atmosphere, but then see what I'm saying? People could pay, and at the same time, they won't be ticketed and all this stuff for camping and being homeless, because not everybody can afford such nice places. Um, my name is Maria Gutierrez, and um, um, I mean, <clears throat> do you understand everything I say? Because those two issues. Yes. Okay. Um, I thank you. Thank you. Thank David you. G. No, you can go now. I just take the cards and however they came up to me in order, the people turned them in. I have them in that order. Sounds good. Okay, well, I'm David Grajeda. It's my second meeting. Um, I enjoy coming here and seeing how good our community is and what's wrong with it. Um, I think that the pitch idea is great. I mean, but I don't think that's enough. I think that everybody should just be able to start a business regardless in the home, sell to the neighbors if they want to, things like that. Um, you know, I, the Antelope Valley to me is just getting worse in my position. I mean, it's so hard to find work and you see all these people putting up the solar panels and then you find out that most of them aren't even from this valley. It kind of sucks, you know, that maybe... Uh, you know, we should be able to get those types of jobs. Maybe they, there's a program to train us to get those types of jobs. Um, you know, I have a million dollars ideas every day, but it's kind of hard to uh, articulate them to people that might care. Um, but uh, I just see that, you know, they, they, they seem like very uh, knowledgeable people when it comes to horses. I'm sure they wouldn't treat their, their animals, you know, uh, badly. You know, that sounds great. I mean, to see a horse-drawn carriage on the boulevard would be amazing. You know, I, I feel that that when we look at this city and we see that every, there are more and more things are developing and you want to get a part of it, you know, it's kind of hard being in someone in my position where, you know, every, every day I go outside and I see somebody, you know, being hassled by the sheriffs or getting a new city ordinance violation and having to pay what I call the beautification tax. You know, where it's just getting out of control, and I uh, just there's so many things you can't have your Christmas lights up right now just because maybe you're lazy and you don't want to take them down because you've had a long day at work and you get a $500 ticket in the mail, or your grass is too high, or there's a pothole where people have to spray paint their lawn because they're trying to avoid the city ordinance and the harassment from the cops because now I guess they're ticking up to 400 times more than they used to. I mean, I got that from the last city hall meeting where they said 
the highway patrols are now going to 400% more tickets. So if they're writing 10 tickets, they're now writing 400 tickets or something like that, which is outrageous. I mean, it's just, I feel like every every way I turn, every somebody's had he's either got a ticket or is getting you tickets. You have 30 seconds. I know. Um, thank you. Uh, I just think that you guys need to try harder when it comes to our community, like people like me that, that are just broke and looking for something to do. And that's why I'm here. I need something to do. Thank you. Thank you. David Paul. No, no, don't. You can't interrupt the public meeting there. You're good. You'll have your turn. Not to interrupt the public meeting, but you'll have your turn to speak. Mr. Paul. Mr. Vice Mayor and Council, good evening. I love to come to Council. I see a lot of people here that have things to say, and that helps us. I wanted tonight to open a dialogue on faith and the things we believe. Um, the winning pitch idea, uh, it just got me thinking. I hope we include some light manufacturing. Ten years ago, I bought this uh, pooper scooper that, that said on there, designed by a ten-year-old. And the thing is perfect. It's got a little cylinder, and you put Walmart bags on it, and it catches it, and it's really convenient. And, and something like that's a great tool, and, and somebody could invent something like yeah, that. Yeah, one the size for a horse. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Now, Mr. Vice Mayor, suppose you were an idiot. And suppose... Some, some people have suggested that. <laughs> and suppose you were a member of Congress. What but I repeat myself. That's what Mark Twain said over 100 years ago. I found this thing today that I liked. I've never heard it before, Adley Stevenson. He says, public confidence in the integrity of government is indispensable to faith in democracy. When we lose faith in the system, we have lost faith in everything we fight and spend for. Our local government fills me with hope because there is such great integrity and interest in making things right. We have little control over the county, state, and federal folly sometimes, but this here is what is good for the people to be able to come and meet and gather and exchange ideas, and uh, I just love to be a part of it. So with that, I'm just going to say good night, and I look forward to hearing what our fellow citizens have to say. Thank you. Thank you, David. Michael Reeves. Uh, council, staff, fellow citizens. Uh, first of all, I want to echo what uh, Vice Mayor Smith said about our city staff. We have an excellent city staff in the city of Lancaster. Uh, whether it's code enforcement, public works, I always get service whenever I uh, ask for it. I'm, I'm really pleased and uh, proud of our staff. Tonight I'd like to also address something that Councilman Chris uh, mentioned to me. I wrote a letter uh, which published in the Antelope Valley Press uh, a week or so ago, in which I opposed the solar plant project and the Palmdale plant project. And there seems to be a confusion. In the article, I wanted to point out that I did not believe that we discussed the solar plant with the same diligence that Councilwoman Marquez and Councilman Chris did with the uh, power plant. They did an excellent job of presenting the issues uh, for the power plant. And uh, my article was uh, concerned about, I wish we would have spent more time addressing the issues of the solar plant. Uh, and I, that being said, I'd also like to comment tonight on the, the hiring of the new director for the Antelope Valley Transit Authority. And this is no reflection on the qualifications of the person that was selected who has an abundance of an experience. That's not the issue tonight. The issue tonight that I'm talking about is the, the salary and the benefits that are being extended to this new uh, director. We're in a fiscal crisis in this country. Uh, there's big discussion about salaries and corporations. There's a big discussion about salaries for government workers. And here we are offering this person a base salary of $165,000 a year with a provision for a 10% merit increase at the discretion of the board. Uh, this person gets a, uh, assigned an AVTA vehicle, gets reimbursed for travel, train travel, 
and also gets 6% uh, of her base uh, salary contributed to her retirement plan. Here we are paying someone that oversees an agency that has a major contract for someone else. 30 seconds, Mr. Whereas we pay our city manager 244000 for direct supervision. I think there's a discrepancy there. I don't think that a person that is overseeing an agency that's contracted out should make over $200,000 a year, whereas we have a city manager that could pay $244,000 for direct supervision. I think in the future we need to be a little more savvy about offering salaries. This Thank you, Mr. Reeves. Thank you. Mr. Aver. Good evening, Council, staff, and uh, citizens. First and foremost, I want to, uh, I agree with Mr. Lawson. I want to commend Ms. Brubaker as well as Shannon Dow. Um, I had issues this past two weeks, and they were very professional and extremely prompt in uh, addressing my concerns, and they should be commended. Uh, hopefully others can follow in those footsteps. Um, with the power plant, um, I'm really curious to why this council dropped the ball, quoting somebody, um, with respect to uh, Sherry and Ron, when Mr. Talbot, as well as Ms. Williams from DCAP came in here to let you know 14 months ago, 15 months probably now, that we had a problem, but instead of embracing these people that knew what was happening before this council did, you threw them under the bus and embarrassed them. And I don't understand that. You always preach up there that you want uh, public input. Yet, when you got it, we see what you did to Mr. Talbot as well as Ms. Williams. With respect to the prayer at the council meetings, I'm curious, has any of the churches or the religious people come in here and wanted to hold their meetings in the council? I don't think so. And I doubt you guys have ever wanted to hold a city council meeting in their churches. I made a suggestion back two Augusts ago, coming up, that I'd be happy to do the invocation, grant you guys the wisdom and courage to make the right decisions that affect us all, take a moment and get on with the meetings. And so if people chose to pray silently, then they could. But instead, that wasn't a good idea. Instead, you'd rather get a lawsuit filed against you, which you're going to lose. And uh, they're going to uphold the ruling that was already in, in effect that I told you about in Burbank to begin with. Uh, with respect to the double standard on people putting their speaker cards in on time, I've got a real problem with that. I recall the mayor a few meetings back saying that uh, he knew the person didn't have their speaker card in on time, but that's what we have the city attorney for. And with this kind of behavior and the policy, there's no wonder we're involved in, you know, half a dozen lawsuits Three or seconds, more. Mr. Um, in finishing, I take issue with you this evening trying to limit the speakers on what they have to say. This First Amendment in this country guarantees us all the right to peaceful assembly as well as freedom of speech. And trying to suggest what we can say on non-agendized items which I don't think has ever happened before, it's a first this evening, or because you don't know what the people are going to say on agendized items, trying to cut them off. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eber. Mr. Talbot. I'm working on my second replace knee. So I uh, just got out of the hospital today. I came to make a, an offering for your Heroes Park. It's printed on metal. should last 20 to 30 years. Of course, I'll never be around to make sure that happens, but uh, this is a poem I wrote shortly after the 9-11 occasion. It was published in the County Fireman's Magazine in February 2002 and it was submitted and authorized by Chief Freeman. And I'd like to read it to you and offer it for your Heroes Park uh, for display. 
my brother was a fireman too, LA County. And the people at the aviation memorabilia, they did this for free. And there's one for Palmdale for their Heroes Park for Bert Quinones. And I'll present that next month. Call 911. They answered the call not knowing they would fall. They mounted their red and white steeds in the face of black deeds. They raced to an uncertain fate in a world now filled with terror and hate. They faced perilous tasks protected by flimsy white masks. They rose to great height while others fled in fright. They united in brotherly love as death reigned from above. They dug on hands and knees so that others would be freed. The wealth of world trade now relied on their gutsy brigade. Their badges, once bright and shiny, were now dusty and grimy. In saving others' lives, they left behind shattered wives. Many families once together were now separated forever. Dead because of a jihad, they all rest with their own God. Thank you, and I will present that. Yes, Mr. Talbot, thank you very much. <laughs> Neil Holmes. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, first of all, I want to apologize for being unorganized earlier. I'm sorry. I'm, um, I like that company, the winning. The winning, I like that. I'm, um, five years, I'm still struggling on. I'm an inventor. I'm the entrepreneur. I'm still, I got the idea. It started from a youth center. And uh, we get together with Boy Run and some acres I've been taking a look at, about 320 acres to get started with. And uh, once my buddy tested and, you know, we plant, and I'm talking about really, I'm solar city. Solar city, the wind. That's a hard thing. What, what do you think? Oh, this is for you to comment. I'm, that's what. I'm trying to see if everybody uh, agrees to that. It's, it's not a group discussion. It's a it's a your okay. time to give your comments on city agenda, That's, city non agendized business. Yes, um, everything is looking looking beautiful, and I want to help it grow. Very good. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Thanks, sir. Linda Williams. Good evening. Thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, mine's mostly about the redevelopment money. From what I see uh, on the city's website, it talks about using it to clean up blight. When I look up what blight is supposed to be, then uh, it's... Uh, run down where it shows people don't care, so on and so forth. I live in the 93534 area code. When I personally talk to my neighbors, it's not that we don't care, we don't have. And as the city code enforcement is coming around and doing their job, and they're doing a very good job, uh, and we're getting tickets, and we really are spray painting our grass, what people don't seem to realize is that our, house, our houses are built in older sections, so we have Bermuda grass. So in the winter, or when the temperature reaches 45 degrees at night, it goes dormant. So as we're under this, it's not tall fescue, it's not bluegrass. I suppose we could oversee with rye, but if we had the money, we would do it. It's not that anyone is trying to keep it from us, but as I look at the website and anything that I can find in relationship to the city and redevelopment, what I see is that uh, they use the census, and I probably will never fill out another census again, to show my race, my sex, the lack of money that I make, the fact that my house was built in 1954, and so on and so forth. And they use that in my neighborhood in general to say because of the age of our homes, because of our ethnic makeup, and so on and so forth, that we are now considered as blight. I would like to make it very clear that if I spent $20 million on my home, 
and I lived with a rock throw away because that's where my, or that's where the uh, parade used to start off on 10th Street West. So they say we don't have pride. My neighbors would be outside watching people getting ready to go up the boulevard to do the parade. And since the $20 million project, we don't count anymore. Our tax dollars used to be fine then, and now for some reason they don't count. They're tearing down buildings. If there's a problem, absolutely get people out of there. But you're putting people out of their homes who had a little bit of money, maybe a little bit less education, and so on and so forth. And what I will say is like to remind everybody that in eight to ten years from now, everybody else's room or house in this room is going to be old too. So what's going to happen if this redevelopment game continues to play? As everybody's saying, yeah, get rid of them over there on 10th and the 93534, one day it's going to be 93535 and 93536. And then you're going to be standing there saying, why is this happening to me? And that's because we're allowing it to happen to someone else. Seconds, Ms. Williams. And as long as we think that we are someone other than who we are, we're going to be the ones that get blindsided. Thank you. Well, one thing on the grass, I, we can, I mean, can look into that because I know some grasses go dormant. That's a question that's come up before. But just to just to clarify for redevelopment, that the redevelopment agency does not use ethnic demographics to define blight. If they are using it according no, to I'm the census you website and using the census. No, we, we don't. We don't use that to define blight. So, but thank I you very much. I can fax it to you. I will. I hope not, because I live in the nine three five three four area also. Nicole, your turn. Hey, well, you know, like the mayor, you guys just said, the mayor says, oh my God, we don't want group homes. This is not about him. We don't want group homes. We don't want all these people. And then he, he like counts, and then you guys go out and count like all the homeless people, but do we really don't give the, like the lower community services. And then I just don't want, I wanted to just understand what part of the group home element, which I, I was thinking about and I was trying to maybe understand what part he didn't like about those people. But you know, Mr. Um, Will, uh, Smith, the, um, the, just like the, the container, the container um, pr proposal for the clearinghouse, okay, that, that was originally supposed to be for what it was originally supposed to be. But you all, you guys took it to the point where um, it'll make the community look blight, but it was created for the emergency um, design and for what you guys change it to. And you, Mr. Smith, sorry for pointing, Mom told me not to, it, um, your, your clean cutness um, would calm me down and my, my cut would sort of give you an edge. And so, and that, so maybe we should like partner in designs and, 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 and uh, you know, you know, come on. But I know you're like this and that scares me, <laughs> but you're good. But that scares me. Um, but as for the CDBG grant, um, I oppose, it's just not gonna work for me. Um, however, if we sort of um, did some, some, uh, some rearranging like um, the Section 8 loans repayment, um, take that and put it into like, or add like 500,000 of that and, and the capital improvement grant and, and the transportation funds. Um, well, if we could, I'll submit something, but that, I mean, because you guys, I oppose to, uh, Distributing the CDVG grant and stuff because it's not right. Because you know those people fighting over in that country right now on the news last night, they they were like because they wanted their their services, so it's not right to take like um, the services that are supposed Second to be for the people goal. and give it to uh, like paying uh, for repayment of like general funds and stuff. So you've got to keep our allocation. If you're going to keep it, then you got, you're going to keep it in our pocket. We want a DMV. We don't want to stand out there. We don't. We don't want to stand out there, and so that could, with the CBD grant, we could do that better yet. Um, so, and if the Public Safety Justice Commission and the Housing Revitalization Thank could you. be tied in together, it would satisfy.
Next, we'll take the addendum, which was a discussion and action taken for the, um, let me get the official name here, Citizens Redistricting Commission, and, and that was my agenda item that I put on. I did talk to the mayor about this, and uh, he knows that it was going on and um, had a support for putting this on. Uh, let me uh, tell the citizens what happened. On May 1st, there was the 15-member citizen commission for redistricting in California. Every 10 years after the census, per the Constitution of the United States, there has to be a redistricting of congressional districts within 1 percent to make sure that, that you have a, a one man, one vote is what they call it. Um, to make sure that the districts, because certain districts grow and certain districts shrink, so you have to have proper re representation. They also redistrict the Board of Equalization, the Senatorial Districts, and the Assembly Districts. Everybody that day gave a speech that came through that were from the Antelope Valley about keeping this Antelope Valley whole. This community, I haven't lived here as long. I mean, most of the people that have been here longer, their, their grandparents, you know, staked out a claim here, their great-grandparents. I mean, we have names that go back the lanes and a long time. Um, geographically, I think everybody here knows we're very unique. Biologically, we have our own water basin. We, we have our own joint powers authority agencies. We, even though sometimes we might not get along with the city of Palmdale, we, we share common interests. And this is really one community, if I've always said, the Antelope Valley. Well, after all that testimony, about the history and the commonality of our Antelope Valley. And, and let me just digress just one second here and talk about that. If you take just the two cities of Lancaster and Palmdale, we represent about 63% of what an assembly district is supposed to be. If you take the unincorporated areas of the desert floor, we represent about 80% of an assembly district. If you then take the Antelope Valley desert floor, which would be a little bit of Mojave and Rosemont, we are 93% of an assembly district. But this commission decided to split this valley in half. And their initial tentative um, track map, or not track map, their tentative map that they're going to submit on June 10th of what they're alluding to was suggesting that the city of Palmdale should be hooked up with the city of Victorville and the city of Lancaster should run down and be hooked up with the city of Santa Clarita. Now, myself, I oppose that and I think most of the people in the valley that spoke, whether it was the Antelope Valley Board of Trade, the Antelope Valley you know, any of the organizations that have AV in front of it have said exactly the same thing, that we need to stay as a community being represented by one representative. And so I've written up for, uh, and for your comments too, I've written up a resolution here, and I won't read it, but it's basically going through exactly that to be sent to the commission, because on June 10th they will be submitting their first tentative map. And, and if you know how government goes to get to that point, sometimes it's a little bit hard to change it once it's submitted, even though there's going to be public comment and then another tentative map and then public comment and then in August it's going to be permanent. So I think it's very important uh, that we get that representation because they could ultimately then give us two Senate districts. They could split and take our Lancaster Santa Clarita and nest it with a Ventura County one into one Senate district and take Palmdale and Victorville and nest it with a San Bernardino one and have two senators also. So. Um, I brought that today and um, put that on that at the last minute because of the urgency of it. No, I, I completely oppose what they uh, want to put in place, and I support the Antelope Valley as one entity, and it needs to stay that way. So I'm thank you for bringing that forth. And thank you for speaking at the uh, May 1st meeting. But it has to be Lancaster and Palmdale as one unit. I really don't care all the other mixes, but Lancaster and Palmdale have to stay together as a unit. Right. So I agree with this 100 percent. So uh, we're going to vote on the uh, the language on this one is accurate. There was one change that was submitted on the agenda staff report, but we verified that this language on the one that is in front of you with the wording, quote, the geographic integrity of every city, county, comma, city and county, comma, neighborhood or community of interest shall be re respected. And that is the that is the instruction under law that the redistricting committee is supposed to be following. And clearly, I guess they didn't understand it if they split in Little Valley in half. I mean, it's one thing if you're, you know, a little smaller geographic area, but this is 
This goes back a long time. So that's the language that we're going to have in this particular uh, one. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make the motion for this, that we, uh, we uh, adopt this resolution, that it be signed and sent to uh, the, the Citizens Redistricting Commission in Sacramento. Just a, uh, a question. Sure. Vice Mayor, um, sure. will the Mayor and uh, Councilman Mann have the ability to sign this resolution? Uh, yes. If they choose to? Yeah. Uh, Mr. McEwen, can they, can, can they sign on this if we pass this resolution today? If or they would the resolution to? be signed by the Mayor or? Well, typically, the resolution would be signed only by the Mayor, but in this case, the Vice Mayor, since you were pre presiding at the meeting, and then the City Clerk. Could we, even though the other two you are could, not here, you could, could you all could of probably us probably pass it on with a cover letter signed by all five of you. Okay. If that's the direction of the council at this meeting. So, so if it's okay, if we can give also direction, I'll work with staff on drafting a, a cover letter, then all of us can approve it and, and sign it. That would be great. Okay. I'll second the motion. Okay. We'll call for a vote. Thank you. Okay. Uh, council agency comments. Ms. Marcus, anything? Okay. Mr. Curtis. Just a clarification on the, uh, the enforcement has gone for 100% up on the uh, 14 by the CHP. And again, if you're drinking and driving, don't do it because they'll catch you. Very good. Uh, closed session items, uh, I've been informed from the um, from council that there's really nothing at this time. They thought that there would be some stuff to report on, but there's nothing. So we're going to pass the closed session items at this time. So if there is nothing else, then we are adjourned until the next regular scheduled meeting on Tuesday, May 24th at 5 p.m. We're adjourned.